Is Sea of Stars a great throwback RPG, or is it only good because of its clear inspiration from classic games? Watch on to hear what I think. Hi, I'm Michael. Welcome to my spoiler-free review of Sea of Stars. Ramin scored this game with me, but isn't able to join me for this review, so I'm sailing solo. See what I did there? Sea of Stars is a 2023 turn-based RPG, the newest game that we've reviewed on this channel. It still fits that we, a uh, channel mostly obsessed with retro media, would cover this game. It wears its retro JRPG influences on its sleeve. The game has several specific influences, but the strongest seems to me to be Chrono Trigger. Its art style is somewhat reminiscent, and some aspects of the gameplay feel pretty similar. It has the composer from Chrono Trigger as a guest composer on some of its soundtrack. It even shares a few story traits with Chrono Trigger. The importance of relationships, the need to make sacrifices, and the resolve to stand against your own fate. This game was created by Sabotage Studio, an indie game studio from Quebec, and was directed, written, and co-designed by Terry Boulanger. This team did some really excellent work. Sea of Stars is easily available for Windows, Switch, PS4 and 5, Xbox One, X, and S. But you'll have to stick around to the end to see if I think you should play it. The story of this game is pretty strong. It plays with a lot of tropes like destined warriors fighting against all odds, a secret order of evildoers, and a mysterious friend who comes and goes. But it feels both reverent to the history of these tropes and curious enough to play around with them and to make them a bit fresher. The world is also excellent. It's beautiful, extremely detailed, but also remarkably cohesive. There's a little bit of lore for so much of what you see and experience in the game, and it really enriches the experience. I think the game falters a bit on its pacing. For instance, I think we spend too long on Wraith Island, constantly shrouded in darkness and with undead enemies, but overall it's pretty good. Where the game falters a bit more is in its specific writing. This is a subcategory that carries over into the characters category, but I'll mention it here. A lot of the writing falls flat. The actual basic plot points and character motivations are all there, but the specific words chosen for the scenes are somewhat weak and lifeless. This isn't enough to bring the whole score for either of these sections down, but it is something that I found myself repeatedly noticing. I'll go into a couple specific examples in the next chapter. The characters in Sea of Stars are, I think, where the game falters the most, but they're still not bad at all. Starting with the heroes, if we focus on just Valer and Zale, that's where we see the most room for improvement. They're both pretty dull, especially compared to the rest of the cast of heroes. Valer is maybe a bit more interesting. She's a little stoic and cautious and isn't always the first person to jump into things but I don't think she shows those traits enough for them to be really obvious. Zale doesn't really have strong characteristics at all. I think it would have been fairly easy to have Zale be more impulsive, quicker to anger, but also quicker to open up and be warm with somebody. That would be a nice foil for Valer and would make both of them stronger characters. As it stands, they seem to be pretty much the same person by about halfway through the game. Also, it bugs me a bit that they each have to respond with ha 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 in the text every time something moderately funny happens. The animations in this game are so good. Why couldn't they pull a 2D Final Fantasy and have the character sprites actually laugh to show instead of tell? When the two main heroes are so comparatively lifeless, it actually makes it a little difficult for me to relate to the game. The next hero we meet is Garl, and the game actually seems to revolve around him. He's so immediately lovable. Luckily, the game seems to know that he's the most interesting character in the bunch because many of the NPC interactions are with him. Next, we meet Sarai, the mysterious friend that I mentioned earlier. I like her as a character overall, but I find the mysteries involving her to be a little lame once you finally discover all of them. I do like that Valer and Zale tell her that they figured out one of her secrets because surely the player has caught on quite early about that one too. 
I can't speak too much about the two remaining playable characters, Rashan and Beast, without spoiling anything, so I won't say much. But I'll just say that I like Rashan, but I'm actually a little annoyed that he's a playable character at all once you find out more about him. His backstory is really well written, though. Beast is just okay. He's a very late recruit and doesn't have particularly strong characteristics, so I don't feel any strong connection to him. The villains are overall pretty good. Most of them are fairly big spoilers to go into very far, so I'll just give some light touches here. The Acolytes are pretty cool, but I wish they were in more of the story. I do love the lore about how they're able to leave the Clockwork Castle, though. Other than that, you have an adorable villain who's not really a bad person, just misguided. A villain who's not super concerned with the dealings of the big bad, but is just selfish of her own accord. A tortured lost soul who has a really satisfying story in the post-game, and of course the big bad himself, the Fleshmancer. His story and motivations are actually super compelling. The game does a good job of balancing him as the all-powerful great evil that is hinted at but not seen, to being the big bad that we actually see do some evil stuff. The important NPCs are also really nice. I want to focus on just a few. Brugaves and Erlina are incredibly complicated characters. In them, you can kind of see the prototype of what Valer and Zale could have been if they were just a little bit more compelling. Headmaster Moraine is also very interesting as you get to know him better. Teeks is a pretty fun character, but I feel like she is just short of great. Until you see her in the end credits, I love her there. The pirate crew is so great, I love them. And their goofiness is very much needed in this game. Yolanda's joke about her middle name is actually really funny when you get to the punchline of it. I just want to say, for those of you who have completed the game, you may disagree with the category, hero, villain, or NPC, that I've put one or two characters into. Let's just say, I know, and let's leave it at that to avoid spoilers for the people who haven't played. Now we get to the big categories where Sea of Stars knocks it out of the park, starting with the graphics. Anyone who has watched any of our video game reviews knows that we're not really great at talking about the graphics. We can just say whether we like or don't like it. The graphics in this game are so nice though. One slight issue I have is with the animated cutscenes. The characters look a little derpy sometimes in those. Design is also a 10 out of 10 for this game. This game is so gorgeous. It balances variety and cohesion really well. The character sprites are all easy to distinguish, and there was obviously so much love and care put into their designs. The monsters, too, have so much character to them. They go from adorable to pretty scary. The towns are all very distinct in their look and feel, even down to how the various townspeople dress. But I want to pay special attention to the dungeon design, which is especially great. Not only do the dungeons look awesome, they are full of puzzles that are mostly fun and well made. A couple of the dungeons are too long, though. Special shout out to the Song Shroom Marsh for being adorable. The score to Sea of Stars was composed mostly by Eric W. Brown, but some of the tracks were composed by the legendary Yasunori Mitsuda, composer of Chrono Trigger, Xenogears, and Chrono Cross, to name a few. Most of Mitsuda's tracks are more to my taste, but Brown's music is also very good. It's tough to be compared to one of the legends of the medium, and Brown more than holds his own with some truly excellent tracks. I like Brown's emphasis on percussion and fun meters in his tracks. Mitsuda's music is fuller and richer and has more life to it, but you actually don't always want that in a video game soundtrack. You don't want to draw the attention of the player too much. The music should help you focus on what you're doing in the game and enhance the mood of that experience. I don't think any of the tracks by either composer goes too far into being attention-seeking, thankfully. I love how the music helps set the mood for sun-baked hills, underwater exploration, creepy forests, desolate wastelands, and the like. But one of my favorite themes in almost any RPG is the theme you hear when you travel somewhere by ship. Melisma of the Waters is one such great track, and you've been hearing my cover of that song throughout this video. See what I did there with the Melisma? To get more information on what I mean, check out my video on Melismas. Link in the description and up there in the corner. The last big category, gameplay, is another one that is quite good, but not perfect. Movement feels good. 
the camera and learning curve are just right. All of the mechanics feel intuitive. Rumina and I disagreed about the appropriateness of the difficulty of the game. I like that you can pretty easily set the difficulty for yourself. The battles are the main issue knocking points off our score. The number of random battles is just right, and there's not too much grinding necessary. The boss battles are usually fun puzzles to figure out how to break their locks in the allotted number of turns. The issue is that the battles get quite old by the end of the game. The boss battles remain fun, but it feels like you're just doing the same thing over and over in the regular battles. I don't think the regular battles should be as complicated as the boss battles. Instead, I think they should actually be more mindless, so you can just breeze through them without thinking too much. But now for the good of the battle system, the timed actions. Every regular attack by a character, and many of the special attacks, can be made more powerful by pressing a button at just the right time. This works just like Super Mario RPG does. You can also get a little extra defense from most enemy attacks by pressing a button at just the right time. If you perform enough timed button presses correctly, a meter fills up that allows you to perform combo attacks between two of your characters. This is like Chrono Trigger. If you perform enough of your character's special skills, another meter fills up that allows you to perform a character's ultimate skill. These ultimate skills and several of these combo attacks are incredibly powerful. And if you get good enough at your button timing, several skills like Valer's Moonerang can go on basically indefinitely and cause incredibly huge amounts of damage. It's fun when you go all out, but when you're managing your resources through a long dungeon, the battles can get old. So even though I said some less than complimentary things in this review, I do think the game is very good. But what do other people think? When it comes to awards, the game won two big ones. Best Indie Game at the 2023 Golden Joystick Awards, and Best Independent Game at the Game Awards 2023. Metacritic aggregates critical reception at an 89%, and OpenCritic aggregates the score at a 98%. Our own formula, based on the scores in the title cards in this video, comes to an 88%. I felt that this game deserved an 82%, and Ramin felt that this game deserved an 80%. If you average our three scores together, this game gets an average of 83% or a B. Here's where this game's score fits in with other games that we've reviewed. As I usually say, some of these scores are a little off and might need to be reconsidered at a later date. So, would I recommend you play this game? I will say probably yes. If you're a big fan of retro menu style RPGs, then you should probably check this one out. If you come to a game expecting amazing story, characters, and gameplay, you'll probably still enjoy it, it just might not be your favorite. I'm glad I played this game, and I hope you are too if you play it. Thank you so much for watching. Have you played this game? What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments. I love to read your thoughts and have conversations with you. Please give this video a like if you liked it, or please give it a pity like if you didn't like it. Two, this side is a video that YouTube thinks you might like, so check that out. Up there is the link to the channel. We put out almost weekly videos reviewing, rating, ranking, and rambling about media, mostly video games and music. Please subscribe if you're into that sort of thing. That should do it. Maintain your groovy selves.